Hello, I am Aldrin Dior Manalo and together with Mike Maniego, we are going to discuss the essential elements of contracts and obligations. Article 1156 of the New Civil Code Law of Obligations and Contracts. So in this law, we are going to talk about the responsibilities and duties of an individual to another person with their agreement to each other and what are the things that he or she must do and not to do. So now let's talk about obligation. Latin word obligare meaning to bind, a juridical necessity to give, to do, or not to do. First, let's discuss obligation to give. A entered into contract B whereby the former bound himself to build a house for B. This means that the obligation to give here is A must provide the house for B. Next is the obligation to do. A and B entered into an agreement whereby the former obliged himself finish the house for B in 3 months. So the obligation to do here is A must finish the construction of the house of B in just 3 months. Obligation not to do. A and B signed a contract whereby the former bound himself would be not to construct any extension for the house if it's not included on the plan, especially on the months specified. So the obligation not to do here is the construction for the extension of the house. So A has no obligation to construct any extension for the house, not, not unless B would give another month for the extension of his house. We have four essential requisites of obligation. Number one. A passive subject, the person who is bound or has the duty to fulfill the obligation called the debtor or obligor. So means that they are the one who provides services to their customer. Number two, an active subject, the person who can demand the fulfillment of the object or presentation called the creditor or obligee. So they are the one who receives the services. So they are the customers. Number three. An object or presentation, this is the subject matter of the obligation, it is either the giving of a thing or the doing or not the doing of something. So this is the plan that the both sides agreed upon. So, so ito yung bagay na napagkasunduan nilang parehas, na kung ano, yung dapat, kung ano yung gagawin ni engineer for example. Number four, a juridical tie, legal tie, or the wind gloom. It is that which binds the parties to the obligation. It is otherwise known as the efficient cause. So ito yung legal paper na yung both parties ay pumirma sa agreement nila. Let's take an example. X promised to create an interior design for the house of Y for 1 million pesos by virtue of contract signed by them. Passive subject X. So ang passive subject natin dito is X. So sabihin na natin si X is si engineer. Ngayon, sabi niya dito is she mag magpo-provide or magki-create ng interior design for the house of Y. So sabi natin si Y is yung employer or yung nagtaong nagpapagawa. So siya yung active subject natin. Tapos object or presentation, interior design for the house. So yung interior design for the house kasi yun yung napag-usapan gagawin ni engineer na na magi-interior design siya sa bahay ni Y or ni employer juridical or legal tie contract Ito sabi kasi dito for 1 million pesos by the virtue of contract signed by them so yung kontrata yung legal paper or yung patunay na na pumirma silang dalawa na yun at ang napagkasunduan nga is yung 1 million pesos na gagawin ni engineer sa pag interior design para sa bahay ni Y so we have sources of obligations A Derived from law, determined in the civil code or in special laws are demandable and shall be regulated by the precepts of the law. Example, obligation of the spouses to mutually support each other, obligation to pay taxes pursuant to the National Internal Revenue, Revenue Code. Letter B, derived from contracts, the force of the law between the contracting parties and should be complied with in good faith. The contract must be valid and enforceable and must not be contrary to law, morals, good customs, public order, public policy. Example, X agrees to sell his house to Y and the latter agrees to buy the house of X voluntarily. The agreement has the force of law 
the Snyder may not violate the terms and conditions of the contract for it is required by the law that the same must be compiled with complied with in good faith. So ang sabi naman kasi dito is why voluntarily agrees to sell, to buy the house of X. So si Y has the force of law or the duty to obey kasi napagkasunduan na nila ni X na bibili niya yung bahay ni yung bibili niya yung bahay na yon. Letter C. Derived from quasi contracts. Locks the elements of consent and no formal contract between the parties. However, the law considers them to have entered into into an agreement purposely to prevent injustice. There are two kinds of quasi-contracts. Negotiorum gestio. It is the voluntary management of the party or affairs of another without the knowledge or consent of the latter. Example, A went abroad with his family without leaving anybody to look after his house. While abroad, a strong earthquake occurred resulting in the destruction of A's house. Because of the magnanimity of B, A's neighbor, The house was repaired with some expenses. In this case, A is obliged to reimburse the expenses of B. So, ang sabi kasi dito is A has, A has the responsibility to return all the expenses of B in repairing his house. Kahit na voluntarily yung pagtulong ni B. Yun yung negosyo room gestiyo. Number 2. Solution in debity. It is a juridical relation which takes place when something is received, when there is no right to demand it, and it was undoubtedly delivered through mistake, giving rise to the obligation to return it. A owes B the sum of 2,000 pesos. A paid B the sum of 3,000 not knowing that the former incurred on the A debt amounting to 2,000. In this example, B is duty-bound to return the excess of 1,000 pesos. For example, sa engineering, so, ikaw, tas yung employer mo, napaka, na sabi mo is babayaran niya lang for the design, for the interior design is 100,000. Pero, unfortunately, itong si, itong si employer nakapagbayad sa iyo ng 200,000 pesos. So, sa case na yon si engineer, magkakaroon siya ng obligation na ibalik yung yung sobrang ibinayad ni, ni ni employer sa kanya which is yung 100 which is yung sobrang 100,000 pesos yun yung solution in debity letter d derived from delicts or crimes person committing a criminal offense is obliged to pay for the injury thus inflicted crimes or delicts acts or omissions punished by the law example A ball would be resulting in the latter's death. If A is found guilty thereof, he is liable to indemnify the heirs of the decrease. So, for example, si engineering at si employer, yung, habang ginagawa yung bahay, nagkaroon siya ng alitan. So, itong si, si engineer, ang ginawa niya is, na sobrang galit niya is, pinalitan niya ng mga not so good quality yung pampagawa sa bahay. Yung ganun, yung mga kao, yung mga semento. Pinalitan niya yun ng mga low quality material. Ngayon, makalipas yung sabi na natin ng one week or two weeks. Nagkaroon ng damages yung bahay na nag-cost ng injury kay employer. Ngayon, pagka natagpuan na si engineer na ang ginawa ng engineer is low quality lang pala yun sa bahay na yung mga material na ginamit doon sa bahay. So, pagka na, na, na ano siyang guilty, so, doon na papasok yung delicts or crimes. Kasi nag-commit siya ng crimes na na nag-cost ng damage kay employer. Tapos, yung mga damages na natanggap ni jury, yung mga pagkasira ng bahay niya, all ng mga expenses doon is si engineer ang mananagot. Letter E. Derived from quasi-delicts. An act or omission by one person which caused damage to another, giving rise to the obligation to pay for the damage done. There being fault or negligence and there is no pre-existing contract or relation between the parties. Example, in a pedestrian, one who was hit by a speeding jeepney due to negligence. So, halimbawa sa engineering, 
Um, meron kayong kinoconstruct na bahay sa kaso, let's say na nasa barangay lang siya kasi more likely pag sa barangay crowded yung tao. So for example, doon kayo, yun yung situation na doon kayo nagagawa ng bahay. Ngayon, merong dalawang employee si engineer, mga workers niya na nagbuat ng kahoy tapos yung mahabang kahoy na gagamitin doon sa may bahay. Ngayon, accidentally nakatama sila ng isang tao na nanonood lang sa construction. Natamaan siya. Ngayon, nag-cause yun ng injury. Ngayon, lahat ng damages na nakos ng isang ng tao na yun is, ang mananagod doon is si engineer kasi siya yung employer ng ng dalawa. Even though na accidentally lang yun, <laughs> even though na accidentally lang yun, mananagod pa rin doon is si employer kasi siya yung kasi siya yung amo ng dalawa. Yun yung quasi deliks. Persons liable to damages arising from the quasi deliks. So, father or mother, guardians, owners and managers of an establishment or enterprise, employers, the state, the state teachers or head of establishments of art and trade. So, dito nga pumasok yung employers na kanina, sa kanina na example, which is si engineer. We also have nature and effect of obligation. Obligation to be diligent. Every person obliged to give something is also obliged to take care of it with the proper diligence of a good father of the family, unless the law or the situation of the parties requires another standard of care. Baba si engineer, meron siyang responsibility na mag-take charge sa paggawa ng bahay na maayos at maganda. Kasi yun yung obligation niya as an engineer na pangalagaan yung or magbigay or magprovide ng good quality building or houses para dun sa kanilang mga employer. Example natin dito. A binds himself to look for the house of B on certain days. Before the arrival of the agreed upon, A has the accessory obligation to take care of the house such as clean it regularly or monitor it. If the house gets robbed, on the specified days, as a result of A's failure to monitor the house, he shall be liable for damages. So, dito, nagkaroon nga ng rub sa days na wala pa si B. Ngayon, sabi kasi dito is A binds himself to look after for the house of B. So, voluntarily niyang inano yung responsibility na mag-look after do sa bahay ni B. Ngayon, on the responsibilities doon sa nangyaring, kung meron mga nangyaring damages doon sa bahay ni B. So, ang magte-take, judge, magte-take charge doon is si A. Lahat ng damages or mga nawalang gamit, ang may, ang, mag, ang may responsibility ron is si A. Obligation to give a determinating, delivering all its accessions and accessories even though they may not have been mentioned. Accession, pertains to the fruits of a thing or additions to or improvements upon a thing such as trees planted on a land and rents on buildings. Accessories pertains to things joined to or included with the principal thing for the latter's em- embellishment such as frame of the pictures, keys of the car, etc. Obligation to do. If a person obliged to do something fails to do it, the same shall be executed at his cost. Example. A binds himself to construct a building for B. However, it was constructed in accordance with the agreed plans and specification. In this case, it may be ordered and done. Obligation not to do. When the obligation consists in not doing and the obligor does what has been forbidden him, it shall be undone at his expenses. Let's take an example. A and B agree the latter will not construct an adjoining fence between their lands for a certain period. If B violates the agreement, the same shall be demolished at its expense. So, ang sabi kasi dito is si A and B daw meron silang agreement. Ngayon si B nag-violate siya sa agreement na yun. Ang agreement nila is hindi sila magtatayo ng fence between sa houses nila. Dating dun sa land, sa mga houses nila. Ngayon si B nagtayo siya ng fence doon sa between sa mga bahay nila sa lupa nila. Ngayon, si A has the rights para para ipa-demolish yung fence ni B na yun kasi wala naman sa kasunduan nila na yun. 
na magtatayo ng fence sa pagkita ng kanilang mga bahay. Next, we have obligation to deliver. The obligor may bind himself to deliver either a specific or generic thing, rights to the fruits, natural fruits, industrial fruits, civil fruits. Example, A binds himself to deliver the land to B on February 5, 2006. Before this date, B has no rights over the fruits of the land. After February 5, 2006, he has perfect rights over the same. Over the same. However, if A actually delivered the land on February 25, 2006, B could only acquire the acquire real right over the land on such date. Obligations of Contracts Primary Classifications of Obligations Letter A. Pure and Conditional Obligations Pure Obligations are an obligation which is not subject to any condition or burden. Example, A promised to give B the sum of 5,000, meaning the obligation to pay is demandable at once because there is no specific date mentioned for its performance, neither it is subject to any condition imposed for its fulfillment. Dito po sa pure obligation, wala po siyang condition, walang date sa pagbabayad ng utang, and as we're late on construction, maaring siya nagpapagawa, nagpapagawa ng bahay, ay hindi siya nagbibigay ng date or specific date sa kung, kung kailan maka-accomplish yung kanyang bahay. Siguro, um, ang nagpapagawa, um, nilet niya si contractor, si engineer, or si architect na basat maganda, maayos yung pagkapagawa, walang limitasyon, walang, walang specific date na time para ma-accomplish yung kanyang bahay. Siguro, ibig sabihin, wala siyang condition. So, it is pure obligation. Conditional obligation, an obligation whose performance is subject to any condition. Example number one, A binds himself to give B a car as soon as A's mother arrives from Canada. Meaning, the obligation is demandable only upon the fulfillment of the conditions, the arrival of the mother. Dito po, sa conditional obligations may ano subject to any condition may condition so as we relate naman sa uh, civil engineering um binibigyan ng condition for example si uh, si uh, contractor binibigyan ng condition ni na nagpapagawa na in case na matapos ng maganda maging maayos maganda yung floor plan so kumbaga na satisfy siya Ang mga susunod na project ay ibibigay niya uli kay contractor or kay architect. So, yun po. May condition. And that is called the conditional obligation. And for the example number two. I will allow you to use my car until you pass the bar examinations. Meaning, the obligation is immediately demandable but it will be extinguished upon the the happening or the happening of the condition that is the passing of the bar examination. Letter B, obligations with a period. This is an obligation whose performance is subject to the expiration of said period or term. These are the examples. Number one, I will give you a gift on your birthday. Number two, I will give you a 200. Three, payment of taxes. Sa badaling sabi, yung obligations with a period is, there is a certain time. So, ibig sabihin, uh, meron lang saklaw. So, ibig sabihin, merong, merong a certain time na dapat accomplish ito. When, when we relate on the construction, dapat itong ginagawang bahay na ito ay sa gintong month dapat tapos na. So, kumbaga, meron sa dapat uh, kota. So, dapat um, meron, may time, may, may certain time. So, ganun din sa mga nakapaskil po sa, sa mga uh, 
Public Works, dyan po, gawa po ng DPWH, makita mo meron pong date of accomplishment o, o date of accomplish, dapat uh, gintong date matapos na siya, gintong month matapos na siya. And just the given example, di ba, meron siya, I will give you a gift birthday, I will give you a 200 and payment of taxes, may due date. Ganun po yung obligations with a period. Now, letter C, alternative and facultative obligations. Alternative obligations are various prestations are due, but the performance of one of them is sufficient to determine by the choice which rightfully belongs to the debtor unless it has been granted expressly to the creditor. So, various prestations are due. So, makikita po natin dito sa example, A binds himself to deliver to B either a gold ring or a gold watch. So, from the world alternative, marami po siyang mga choices. Ko in case na hindi pwede si gold ring, pwede naman si gold watch. So, pag sa i-relate natin sa construction, pagka nagpapagawa si um, owner ng, ng isang terrace sa may balcony, kung gagamitin ay, ay um, steel bars, pero kung hindi naman siya pupwede, ibig sabihin walang stock doon, pwede naman gamitin yung tubular. So, walang pinagkaiba. Kung baga, um, akma pa rin sa gagawing construction yung mga materials na yun. And uh, yun yung alternative obligation na tinatawag natin. Meaning, A should deliver one of them and it is required that the performance must be complete. That is, he cannot deliver the stone of the ring or bracelet of the watch. Yan po yung meaning ng isang example natin kanina. Facultative obligation is an obligation where one prestation is due, but the obligor or the debtor may substitute another. So, here in facultative obligation, magibigay po ako ng isang scenario or example. Now, for example, ako ay naghiram ng book sa aking kaklase. Sa kasamaang palad, uh, hindi ko alam kung bakit siya nawala or hindi ko intensyon na mawala ang kanyang libro. The, so, dahil ang facultative obligation is no alternative provided, walang choices na, na pwedeng pagpilian. So, para hindi ko masaktan ang nahiraman ko ng book, nag-promise ako sa kanya na in case na hindi ko mahanap, I will give my reviewer to her. So, ibig sabihin, uh, uh, ibibigay ko sa kanya yung aking reviewer bilang uh, kapalit sa, sa book na nawala ko. So, yan po yung facultative obligation. Letter D, joint and solidary obligations. From the word joint and solidary, it has something to do a group obligation. So, a joint, when you want to start a business, uh, syempre meron kang kasama, may kasosyo ka. So, so, it is an obligation as a group. So, willing kayong uh, umutang, willing din kayong magbayad. So, group din yung obligations nyo. So, that is joint and solidary obligations. Letter E, divisible and indivisible obligations. Ito naman ay uh, sa paraan ng pagbabayad. Relate natin sa paraan ng pagbabayad. Si divisible and indivisible ay magkaiba. Si divisible ay partial. Si indivisible naman ay whole. Parang i-relate natin sa pagbabayad ng bahay. Meron po tayong mga uh, kilala na every month nagbabayad ng bahay or yearly. Yan po yung sinasabi na divisible obligations. Pero meron namang indivisible obligations na kailangan buo. Bago mo magamit yung bahay, kailangan uh, fully paid ka bago mo mapakinabangan yung bahay. So, that is a difference differences or difference of divisible and indivisible obligations as well as their meaning. Letter F, obligations with a penal clause. From the, world pen, from, the, from the word penal, penalty clause, obligation, arising law, penalty sa due date. So, so Pwede dito pumasok yung sa electric bill, sa may water bill natin, and sa mga taxes natin. Pag once na due date na, hindi pa nagbabayad. So, you are obligated na 
magbayad pati yung extra money kasi kailangan uh, mabayaran siya sa date sa due date niya kasi kung lalagpas ka there will be an extra money uh, parang isang paglabag is it is, a, it is a penalty and that is the obligations with the penal clause tapos na po tayo sa primary and now proceed po tayo sa secondary classification of obligations a unilateral and bilateral obligations ito po yung scenario na let's relate po natin sa ating pag-aaral pag sinabi po nating bilateral yung kayong dalawa ay may obligation uh, may binitawan kayong promise for example uh, gagawan ko ang kaibigan ko ng floor plan ngayon yung kaibigan ko naman nagagawa na ako ng floor plan gagawa naman ako ng assignment sa English um, na, uh, nagkakaroon ng um, nagkakaroon ng um, ko, ng obligations yung isa't isa so that's what we call the bilateral obligations parehas kayo na may pinramis so pag sinabi namang unilateral isa lang isa lang for example si Math Club nagpromise siya na pag nasagot yung problem na ang uh, sino man makakasagot nito ay uh, mananalo ng load so ikaw naman hindi ka naman nagrespond sa kanya na ako po sasagot so kumbaga it is open naman sa lahat so ngayon pag nasagot mo naman yung um, problem na ibinigay ng Math Club you'll get a chance or you will uh, a load or a packet wifi. So, yun po yung pinagkaiba ng unilateral and bilateral obligations. Proceed po tayo sa real and personal obligations. Simple explanation po. Pag sinabing real, you are obligate give. Obligation to give. And sa personal naman, ay personal obligation to do or not to do or to give or not to give so meron kang choice dun sa may personal obligations sa real obligation kailangan compulsory kailangan uh, bayaran mo ito ito tong mga taxes na ito sa water bill kasi pag once na hindi ka nakabayad mapuputulan ka ganun or ganun din po yun yung po yung pagkakaiba ng real and personal obligations letter C determinate and generic obligations. Um, di um, dito po sa determinate, it state that the loss of a determinate thing through a fortuitous test event extinguishes the obligation, meaning to put an end. Sa, about naman dito sa may determinate obligations, ito yung siguro sa sitwasyon na naiwala mo yung pera or may something na na kumuha noon at sinabi mo na hindi mo naman kasalanan yung 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 uh, obligation is extinguishes ibig sabihin magiging parang wala nang usapan okay lang ganon so kumbaga sasagutin din ng obligation hindi ka na nila pagbabayarin ganon so yun yung determinate obligations ah uh, taliwas sa generic obligations pag sinabing generic obligation um if you lost something na kware eh hindi mo naman sinasadya o o maaaring kinuha sa iyo o maaaring kinuha sa iyo ganun kailangan may managot and ikaw yung may hawak ng pera kailangan masolusyunan mo you are obligated na palitan niyo on so marami pong ganyang sitwasyon so yun pi pagkakaiba ng determinate and generic obligations letter D civil and natural obligation Dito po sa civil and natural obligation, magbigay po tayo ng scenario or example. When we say civil uh, obligation, it is based on positive law, enforceable by court action. Example, let's have a uh, relate sa business kasi, di ba, hindi lang naman tayo aspirant, uh, aspiring uh, engineer kasi gusto rin naman natin maging businessman kasi gusto rin natin magtayo ng sarili nating construction firm. Dito sa example natin, si Engineer De La Cruz is the maker of a promissory note with Engineer De Los Santos as the pay for 300,000. Ito daw po si, ano, si Engineer De La Cruz ay uh, humiram sa madaling sayita ng pera kay uh, Engineer De Los Santos. Ngayon, 
Ngayon, if Engineer De La Cruz does not pay on due date, Engineer De Los Santos can uh, enforce payment by filing a court action. Meaning po na kung sakaling hindi mabayaran ni Engineer De La Cruz yung utang niya, ay eh, meron po siyang mabigat na na kasulatan dahil mayroong promissory note which is legal instrument pwede po siyang mag-file a, filing a court action para kay Engineer De La Cruz so sa natural obligation naman po uh, it is a natural law but not enforceable by court of action parang taliwas silang dalawa si natural obligation Sa senaryo po ng dalawang engineer, si Engineer De Los Santos ay kung sakaling hindi po siya nakapag-file sa court, um, Engineer De La Cruz within 10 years from due date, maaaring ibasura ng korte. Doon na po papasok yung natural obligation kasi nagkulang din naman si Engineer De Los Santos na i-update diba? yung kanyang uh, court action para kay para kay Engineer De La Cruz, maaaring hindi na bumalik o parang ang, ang, ang si court ala na siyang pakialam kumbaga hindi na inuobliga si Engineer De La Cruz na magbayad so sana wag naman sana si Engineer De La Cruz naman ay magbayad kasi uh, sa, nasa principles natin na wala namang lamangan diba? so yun po yung civil and natural obligation. Sa legal, conventional, and penal obligations, sa legal po, it, legal obligation, it is an obligation relating to a business, a property, and etc. While conventional obligation, it is an obligation arising out of a contract. Lastly, the penal obligation, it is penalty obligation to pay extra money. Nung nasabi ko nga po a while ago, no, na yung it is a penalty obligation pagka over na, so due date na, hindi ka pa nakabayad, meron tayong obligation na magbayad tayo ng uh, extra money or yung penalty na tinatawag. So yan po yung penal obligation. Meaning of contract. Contract is a meeting of minds between two persons whereby one binds himself with respect to the other to give something or to render some service. It is a juridical convention manifested in legal form by virtue of which one of or more person bind themselves in favor of another or others or reciprocally to the fulfillment of the prestation to give, to do or not to do. So, sa madaling sabi, contract is a written or a spoken agreement that is intended to be enforceable by law. Difference between contract and obligation. Contract is one of the sources of obligation, while the latter is the legal relation itself. Contract is the very important very agreement of the parties while the obligation is the remedy which the law affords for its enforcement so contract is one of the sources of obligation all contracts are obligations it is enforceably by law written or spoken agreement there are so many obligations written and the contract is one of the sources that under obligation so yun po and here are the examples of contract to give something a offers to sell to b his house for 500,000 b accepts the offer for such amount since there is contract a must give the house to b but the latter is obliged to pay the amount agreed upon example of contract to render some service, A binds himself to construct the house of B for 300,000. So, yan po yung example for the contract to give something and the contract to render some service. Proceed naman po tayo sa essential elements. Essential elements are requisites of a contract. Ibig sabihin, 
kinakailangan siya para sa isang kontrata. And number one, consent of the of the contracting parties. Consent is manifested by the meeting of the offer and the acceptance upon the thing that the cause which are the constitute the contract. So, ibig sabihin na po yung consent of the contracting parties, it should be voluntarily, it should be understandable, it it is proper for, for the state to enforce an obligation. So, incapacitated to give consent. Ang ibig sabihin po ng, uh, nito ay yung, these are the individuals or a person that classified as voidable, meaning magkakaroon ng walang visa yung uh, anumang kontrata or consent if the person or individuals are under this situation. Letter A po natin, an emancipated minors who have not reached the age of major majority, 21 years. B, insane or demented person denotes to the degree of mental illness. And C, deaf, dumb, and cannot write. But a deaf mute who knows how to write could intelligently give consent. Vices of consent. When we say vices, it is a moral fault or failing. Vices are morally wrong. And here are the given vices of consent. A. Error or mistake. B. Violence or force. C. Intimidation, threat, or pressure. D. Undue influence. And E. Fraud or deceit. Essential characteristics of consent. It is intelligent, meaning easy to understand. B. It is free and voluntary. And C. It is conscious or spontaneous, meaning able to understand what's happening and aware si person sa nangyayari. Aware of something. Number two, certain object which is the subject matter of the contract. Requisites of things as object of contract. A. It must not be outside the commerce of men. B. It must not be contrary to law, morals, good customs, public order, or public policy. C. It must be or it must no be impossible either physically or legally. And D. It must be determinate as its kind. So number three, cause or consideration of the obligation which is established. Natural elements are those that are presumed to exist in certain contracts unless the contrary is expressly stipulated by the parties like warranty against hidden defects in a contract of sale. So natural elements, um, as we relate, relate on the contract or as we relate on a business, the seller shall be responsible for warranty against the hidden defects. Accidental elements are the particular clauses, terms, or conditions established by the parties in their contract like interest and penalties. Sa accidental elements naman po, those which exist by virtue of an uh, agreement for the purpose of expanding, limiting, or modifying a contract. Such accidental elements are conditions, clauses, terms, modes of payment, and penalties. So in this part, I will discuss the essential elements of contracts. But before I discuss the essential elements, let's first define what a contract is. Contract is a meeting of minds between two persons whereby one binds himself with respect to the other to give something or to render some service. It is a judicial convention manifested in legal form by virtue of which one or more persons bind themselves in favor of another or others reciprocally to the fulfillment of a presentation to give, to do, or not to do. Meaning, a contract is a mutual agreement legalized or enforced by law. The making of contract requires a mutual assent of two or more persons, one of them originally making an offer and the other is accepting. 
8 provides the duties and obligations that both parties have agreed. And in our field, a contract which is called as construction contract is important as it helps and protect both the contractors and the owners. If there are some instances that one of them lacks onto something or doesn't meet the required obligation is stated in the contract. It also includes the details about the project and the work that will be done and how compensation will be handled related to the project. So now that we know what a contract is, let's move on with the essential elements of contracts. According to Article 1318 of the Civil Code, there is no contract unless the following requisites occur. First, the consent. Second, object of contracts. And the last one is cause of contracts. These three elements will be further discussed as my report goes. So let's have the first element of the contracts which is under the section 1 consent where consent is defined as giving of one's conformity to the terms of the contract freely and voluntarily according to article 1319 consent is manifested by the meeting of the offer and the acceptance upon the thing and the costs which are to constitute the qualified acceptance constitutes a counter offer Acceptance made by a letter or telegram does not bind the offerer except from the time it came to his knowledge. The contract in such a case is presumed to have been entered into the place where the offer was made. This means that the consent will be valid and recognized if both parties agreed and understood the information in the contract. The offer must be certain and acceptable, and for the acceptance of the offer, both should understand each other. Article 1320 An acceptance may be expressed or implied. Article 1320 states that acceptance can be in two forms. The first one is express acceptance, meaning it may be oral or written. And the other one is implied acceptance, which is done from the act or conduct. Article 1321. The person making the offer may fix the time, place, and manner of acceptance of all, which must be complied with. Article 1322. An offer made through an agent is accepted from the time acceptance is communicated to him. Article 1323. An offer becomes ineffective upon the death, civil interdiction, insanity, or insolvency of either party before acceptance is conveyed. An offer may be withdrawn before it is accepted. In Article 1323, even if the offer is not withdrawn, its acceptance will not be accepted in case the offer has already become ineffective because of the death, civil interdiction, insanity or insolvency of either party before the conveyance of the acceptance to the offeror. For example, in that, Anna offered to sell her beach result to Mike for the amount of 1.5 million pesos, but before the day that they are going to meet up for the payment and their contract will be made, Anna died. Therefore, the meeting of the mind of the two parties became ineffective because of the death of Anna. Article 1327 The following cannot give consent to a contract. First, the unemancipated minors. Unemancipated minors are the minors below 18 years of age. Children below 18 by themselves being minors cannot enter into valid contracts. Second one is insane or demented persons and deaf mutes who do not know how to write. Insane or demented person or mentally ill person is not allowed as the people having this kind of condition is detached in reality, doesn't know what they are doing and cannot act with legal effects. Article 1329 The, the incapacity declared in Article 1327 is subjected to the modifications determined by law and is understood to be without prejudice to special disqualifications established in the laws. 
the persons enumerated under Article 1327 or the incapacitated to give consent to contracts due to their lack of mental capacity to do so, but they are not prohibited to exercise their right to enter into a contract. They can still do through a guardian with the approval of the court. Article 1330 A contract where consent is given through mistake, violence, intimidation, undue influence, or fraud is voidable. Article 1331 In order that mistake may invalidate consent, it should refer to the substance of the thing which is the object of the contract, or to those conditions which have principally moved one or both parties to enter into the contract. Mistake as to the identity or qualifications of one of the parties will vitiate consent only when such identity or qualifications have been the principal cause of the contract. A simple mistake of account shall give rise to its correction. So mistake or error is the false notion of the thing or a fact material to the contract. Mistake may be of fact or of law. In general, the mistake to which Article 1331 refers is mistake of fact. It may arise from ignorance or lack of knowledge. While mistake by law is substantial mistake or of fact, that is, the party would not have given his consent had he known of the mistake. Article 1333. There is, is no mistake if the party alleging it knew the doubt, contingency, or risk affecting the object of the contract. It is to be assumed here that the party was willing to take the risk. This is particularly true in contracts which are evidently aleatory in nature. Article 1335. There is violence when in order to wrest consent, serious or irresistible force is employed. There is intimidation when one of the contracting parties is compelled by a reasonable and well-grounded fear of an imminent and grave evil upon his person or property, or upon the person or property of his spouse, descendants or ascendants to give his consent, to determine the degree of intimidation, the age, sex, and condition of the person shall be borne in mind. A threat to enforce one's claim through competent authority if the claim is just or legal does not vitiate consent. So if there are violence and intimidation happened while signing a contract or getting a consent, the contract is voidable. Violence is external and requires the employment of physical force which must be serious and irres irresistible. Article 1336 Violence or intimidation shall annul the obligation, although it may have been employed by a third person who did not take part in the contract. Article 1337 There is undue influence when a person takes improper advantage of his power over the will of another, depriving the latter of a reasonable freedom of choice. The following circumstances shall be considered. The confidentiality, family, spiritual, and other relations between the parties, or the fact that the person alleged to have, become, to have been unduly influenced was suffering from mental weakness or was are ignorant or in financial distress. Article 1339. Failure to disclose facts when there is a duty to reveal them as when the parties are bound by confidential relations constitutes fraud. A neglect or failure to communicate that which a party to a contract knows and ought to communicate constitutes concealment. The injured party is entitled to cancel or annul a contract whether the failure to disclose the material facts is intentional or unintentional. As long as there is a duty to reveal or disclose them, should be made and the other parties misled or deceived in entering into the contract. 
Article 1342. Misrepresentation by a third person does not vitiate consent unless such misrepresentation has created substantial mistake and the same is mutual. Article 1343. Misrepresentation made in good faith is not fraudulent but may constitute error. The misrepresentation made must be unintentional. Article 1345. Simulation of a contract may be absolute or relative. The former takes place when the parties do not intend to be bound at all. The latter when the parties conceal their true agreement. Simulation of a contract is the act of deliberately deceiving others by feigning or pretending by agreement. The appearance of a contract which is either non-existent or concealed or is different from that which was really executed. So now let's move on with the second elements of contract which is under the section 2 object of contracts object of, object of contracts must be definite or determinate as to its kind it must be lawful or it must be within comments of man it must likewise be possible and not in any way contrary to good customs morals public order or public policy article 1347 all things which are not outside the commands of man, including future things, may be the object of a contract. All rights which are not intransimable may also be the object of contracts. No contract may be entered into upon future inheritance except in cases expressly authorized by law. All services which are not contrary to law, morals, good customs, public order, or public policy may likewise be the object of a contract. So the object of a contract is subject matter. It can be a thing, right, or service arising from a contract. Article 1348. Impossible things or services cannot be the object of contracts so the impossibility may be because of the nature of the transaction or because of the law or it may be absolute or no one can do it or it may be relative which the particular debtor cannot comply article 1349 the object of every contract must be determined as to its kind the fact that the quantity is not determinate shall not be an obstacle to the existence of the contract, for by that it is possible to determine the same without the need of a new contract between the parties. Once the object is a specific thing, no need for a new or further agreement between the parties, but when the obligation consists in the delivery of a generic whose quality and circumstances have not been stated, there is a need of a new or further agreement between the parties. So we are now down with the last element of contract, which is under the Section 3, Cost of Contracts. Cost of contract must be true and licit. A contract with an illicit cost produces no effect. Article 1350. In onerous contracts, the cost is understood to be, for each contracting party, the prestation or promise of a thing or service by the other. In remuneratory ones, the service or benefit which is remunerated, and in contracts of pure beneficence, the mere liberality of the benefactor. So the obligation that is needed to be paid attention must be understood by both parties, such as services, beneficiaries, and cost. Article 1351. The particular motives of the parties in entering into a contract are different from the cause thereof. Article 1351 states that the cause and motives of the parties entering into a contract are different. The motive might be purely personal or private reason 
which a party has in entering into a contract, while the cause is immediate or direct reason which moves the contracting parties to enter into the contract and justifies the creation of an obligation through their will. Article 1352 Contracts without cause or with unlawful cause produce no effect whatever. The cause is unlawful if it is contrary to law, morals, good customs, public order, or public policy. If the contract doesn't have cause, direction or will cause harm, it doesn't have effect at all. So a contract must possess these requisites of cause. First, it must exist at the time the contract is entered into. Second, it must be lawful. And the last one is, it must be true or real. Article 1353 The statement of a false cause in, cons in contracts shall render them void if it, if it should not be proved that they were founded upon another cause which is true and lawful. The contract that is proved that contains false statements shall be void. Article 1353 Although the cause is not stated in the contract, it is presumed that it exists and is lawful unless the debtor proves the contrary. So if the contract does not state its cause, the presumption of the law operates that the cause exists and is lawful, unless the debtor proves that there is none. So for the convenience of the parties and of the courts, it is better to that the cause or consideration be stated in the contract. Article 1355 Except in cases specified by law, lesion or inadequacy of cause shall not invalidate a contract unless there has been fraud, mistake, or undue influence. Stages of Contract First, Let's define what is contract. So under the article 1305, a contract is a meeting of mind between two persons whereby one binds himself with respect to another to give something or to render some services. So ang kasunduan daw ay pagtatagpo ng kaisipan sa pagitan ng dalawang tao na kung saan ang bawat isa ay kapwa tutupad ayon sa isa't isa magbibigay ng bagay o gagawa ng ilang gawain. Limbawa nito yung halimbawa, isang engineer tapos architect. May pagkakasundo sila sa isang project na yon na magkasama sila. So, di ba hindi naman agad-agad doon mabubuo yung contract sa pagitan ng dalawa na yon. Kaya may tinatawag tayong stages sa pagbuo ng isang kontrata. And, ano nga ba ang mga ito? There are three stages of contracts. First stage, we have the preparatory. And second, perfection. And the last stage was consummation. Let's start to discuss the first stage, which we called the preparatory. The process of formation through bargaining or negotiation which begin from the time the prospective contracting parties manifest their interest in the contract that leads to the perfection of the contract. Either party may stop the process or withdraw an offer made. So, dito sa stage na to, may mag-offer or mag-offer yung both parties na mga gusto nila or titingnan nila kung magkakasundo sila sa bawat offer ng isa. Halimbawa nito ay isang engineer may nag offer ng isang project na ipapagawa sa kanya. So halimbawa ikaw yung engineer, bago mo tanggapin yung project na yun, i-check mo, mo muna if credible kang gawin yun. Baka si yung project na yun ay pang structural tapos ikaw naman ay isang transportation engineer. Hindi mag-meet yung offer na yun. 
Pero kung yung i-offer ay yung sakop ng kaalaman mo, limbawa is road construction na project, edi credible ka na para gawin yun. Okay na yung offer. Hindi na balak mo nang tanggapin yung project na yun. Pero hindi ka pa nag agree kasi dito sa stage na to, dito pa lang yung tinitingnan mo kung credible or okay sa'yo yung mga offer ng ka kontrata mo o yung kakausap mo. Sa first stage, the preparatory, nalaman mo na kung ano yung mga ino-offer nung isa, tapos pasok sa mga gusto mo, tapos okay na okay na sa'yo talaga yung mga, yung project na yun, then you agreed or said yes to the project. So, the moment you agree to the offer, we are entering in the second stage. The perfection. Perfection was process of arriving at a definite agreement or meeting of the minds as to the elements of the contract, particularly the essential ones. Katulad ng example ko kanina, nag-agree ka na kasi yung offer sa'yo is credible ka para gawin yun. Tapos yung offer yung nag-offer naman as I, ay satisfy sa iyo na ikaw yung gagawa nun. So in this case, in this stage, the contract was made. Nagkasundo na kayo sa kung ano ang gusto nung bawat isa. After the contract was perfected, so the next and the last stage is consummation. The fulfillment of the respective obligations of the parties under the contract resulting to each accomplishment and extinguishment. So, the contract was made in the second stage. Dito naman sa may third stage or the last stage, ba nag-agree ka na or nag-say yes ka na dun sa offer ng client mo or yun nagpapagawa ng project, Tapos yung client mo naman, nag-agreed na din sa iyo na ikaw yung gagawa nun. Dapat, alam niyo yung mga obligations ng bawat isa. Halimbawa, ikaw, yung engineer, dapat matapos mo yung project na yun. Hindi yung ililipat mo sa ibang engineer dahil ayaw mo na. Tapos yung client naman, kailangan bayaran ka niya ayon dun sa napagkasunduan nyo. So, sabi nga dun sa may definition ng third stage, fulfillment of the respective obligation of the parties under the contract. So, kailangan mong gampanan yung kalakip na obligation dun sa mga tinanggap mong offer. Tapos kapag nabayaran na yung engineer, tas natapos na yung project, ito na yung last stage. And we call it consummation. Summarize the three stages of contract. The first stage, preparatory. Dito lang yung nagahanap ka or nakikipag-negotiate ka pa lang sa mga offer ng mga clients. Then, sa second stage naman, may nahanap ka na ng client na nag-offer ng lahat ng gusto mo. Tapos, nag-agree ka na at nabuo na nga yung contract dito. Then, sa last stage naman, dito ginawa na yung, ginagawa mo na yung obligation, tas natupad na din yung mga napag-usapan nyo na nagkabayaran na, tapos natapos na yung project. Tapos, dito rin sa may stage na to, nagtatapos yung contract. Instances of Unlawful Contracts So, Resistible Contracts. This is based on Civil Code Article 1380 to 1389. Before we proceed, proceed to those articles, alamin muna natin kung ano ba ang ibig sabihin ng Resistible. So, pag sinabi natin Resistible Contracts, ay isa siyang legal na kontrata, ngunit ang kontratang napagkas, napagkasunduan ay nagresulta ng pagkasira ng ekonomiya. Kaya maaaring tanggalin ito ng korte o itabi ang kontrata para sa pantay na kadahilanan. So, Article 1380. 
Contracts validly agreed upon may be rescinded in the cases established by law. So, ang isang kasunduan daw o napagkasunduan kontrata ay maaaring ikansila o mapawalang bisa sa mga pagkakataong itinalaga ng batas. And then, Article 1381. So, ang mga sumusunod ay mga kontrata na maaaring ikansila. So, una, those which are entered into by guardians whenever the wards whom they represent suffer lesion pay more than one-fourth of the value of the things which are the object thereof. Number two, those agreed upon in representation of absentees if the latter suffer the lesion stated in the preceding number. Number three, those undertaken in fraud of creditors when the latter cannot in any other manner collect the claims due them. Number four, those which refer to things under litigations if they have been entered into by the defendant without the knowledge and approval of the litigants or of competent judicial authority. And last, all other contracts especially declared by law to be subject to rescission. So, there are five instances na labanggit dito. So, yung number one and number two are somewhat related. An Article 1382 Payments made in a state of insolvency for obligations to those fulfillment in the debtor could not be compelled at the time they were effected are also receivable. So, example, D, while insolvent, pays X his debt, Y and X, Z are also creditors of D but cannot in any manner collect from D. So, si D daw ay nagbayad ng utang during insolvent or in the state of insol- insolvency kay X. So, sa isang cred- cred- creditor lang siya nagbayad. Kaya yung ibang creditor, uh, maaari nilang iparesind na yung kontrata na yon. Article 1383 The action for rescission is subsidiary. It cannot be instituted except when the party suffering damage has no other legal means to obtain reparation for the same. So, example, G is the guardian of M, a minor with two parcels of land valued at 200,000 each. G sold the two properties to B for only 200,000 pesos. So, supposedly, Two parcel yan. So, bali 2 times 200 equals 400,000. So, in this case, resisibo yung contract na ito. And, ano ba yung tinatawag, ano ba yung sinasabi dito na subsidiary? Si M daw, kapag na-attain niya na yung age ng majority, pwede niya nang iparisind yung contract. So, but however, hindi mo siya pwedeng magawa kapag meron kang other option. Halimbawa, si B, willing pala siyang bayaran yung lesion, of, yung lesion na 200,000, kaya hindi mo na pwedeng iparisind. Article 1384 Precision shall be only to the extent necessary, necessary to cover the damages caused. So, example, G is the guardian of M, kamukha lang din ito yung nas- naunang example, a minor with two parcels of land valued at 200,000 peso- 200, each. Uh, G sold the two properties to be for only 200,000. So, in this case naman, kung mapapansin nyo, resisible yung contract. So, kapag ipinarisin mo yung contract na ito, yung sale ng property kasi, yung isang property, okay naman, nakover naman niya, nakover naman nun yung 200,000 pesos. So, bale, yung, yung maririsind lang dito is yung isang parcel ng land. Article 1385 Precision creates the obligation 
to return the things which were the object of the contract, the, together with their fruits and the price with its interest. Consequently, it can be carried out only when he who demands rescission can return whatever he may be obliged to restore. Neither, neither shall rescission take place when the things which are the object of the contract are legally in the possession of third persons who did not act in bad faith. In this case, indemnity for damages may be demanded from the person causing the loss. So, ang main idea dito is, kailangan pag nagkaroon ng rescission as if wala tayong contract, kung ano man ang naibigay natin sa bawat isa, ay kailangan daw nating ibalik. Kailangan, so yun, kailangan nga daw natin ibalik. And sa Article 1386, Uh, rescission referred to number 1 and 2 of Article 1381 shall not take place with respect to contracts approved by the courts. So, kapag na-approvahan ng court, uh, pwede itong gawin, pwede mo itong ibenta, hindi, pero uh, hindi na magiging resistible contract mo kasi in-approvahan na nga ng court eh. Article 1387. All contracts by virtue of which the debtor alienates property by gratuitous title are presumed to have to have been entered into in fruit of creditors when the donor did not reserve sufficient property to pay all debts contracted bef- before the donation. Alienations by an or- onerous title are also presumed fraudulent when made by persons against whom some judgment has been rendered in any instance or some writ of uh, of attachment has been issued the decision or attachment need not need not refer to the property alienated and need not have been obtained by the prop, by the party seeking the rescission in addition in addition to these presumptions The design to the prude credit creditors may be proved in any other manner recognized by the law of evidence. So, sa unang paragraph, uh, gratuitous, gratuitous title, sabi, uh, pag sinabi natin gratuitous title, given or received without payment or obligation. And dun naman sa pangalawang paragraph, sa uh, alienations by onerous title, meaning having or involving burdens or obligation. Article 1388 Whoever acquires in bad faith the things alienated in fraud of creditors shall in then indemnify the latter for damages suffered by them on account of the alienation whenever due to and cause it should be impossible for him to return them. If there are two or more alienations, the first acquirer shall be liable first and so on successively. Uh, example, to the fruit C, S sold to be his car. So B knows S purpose. In this case, B is bad faith. So si C ba pwede niya bang uh, ma-recover yung car ni S at para mapawalang bisa yung sale na ginawa ni S kay B. Kasi nga, uh, resistible yung contract dito. Uh, pwede mo, pwede mo parisin yung contract. Pero kung in good faith, si B, the contract between S and B is not resistible. And Article 1389. The, uh, in this article, is the prescrip- prescription of rescission. So, magpe-prescribe, la, magpe-prescribe ba ang rescission? Uh, of course, yes. Uh, pag sinabi nating prescription, yun yung kumbaga may time limit yung pag re ng isang contract. Kung hindi mo siya maparesint agad, okay, wala na. Uh, magiging per- perfectly valid na yung contract natin. Uh, the action to claim rescission must be commenced within 4 years. So, malinaw na malinaw, 4 years daw. Pero may exception sa 4 years na yon. Ang mga hindi lang 4 years ay yung persons under guardianship and for absentees. 
the period of four years shall not begin until the termination of the former's incapacity or until the domicile of the latter is known. Voidable Contracts Article 1390 uh, Base sa article na ito, uh, ito yung mga reason bakit nagiging voidable yung contract natin. So, kapag merong isa sa mga parties which is incapable of giving consent, magiging voidable siya. Uh, so, ang ang status na ng contract natin ay voidable. And one so, one or more of the vices of consent consent is present is present the contract will become voidable also article 1391 so ito naman yung mahakbang mahakbang para sa pagpapawalang bisa na dapat gawin sa loob ng apat na taon so this period shall begin in cases of intimidation violence or undue influence from the time the defect if the if the consent ceases in this case of mistake or fraud from the time of the discovery of the same and when the action refers to the contracts entered into by minors or other incap- incapacitated persons from the time the guardianship ceases article 1393 So, ratification may be effected expressly or tacitly. It is understood that there is a tacit ratification if, with knowledge of the reason which renders the contract voidable and such reason have ceased, the person who has a right to invoke it should execute an act which necessarily implies an intention to waive his right. So, ang pagpapatibay daw ay maaaring ipakita ng nang hayag o hindi at yung tao na may karapatang mag-apila ay mahahain ng aksyon maghahain ng aksyon na nagpapahiwatig ng kanyang intensyong taliktan ang kanyang karapatan Article 1394 Ratification may be effected by the guardian of the incapacitated person So ang mga nangangalaga daw or yung guardian sa mga taong walang legal na kapasidad o wala pa sa ustong gulang ay maaaring magpatibay din ng kontrata na ginawa ng kanilang alaga. And Article 1395, ratification does not require the conformity of the contracting party who has no right to bring the action for annulment. Uh, ang pagpapatibay, ang pagpapatibay daw ay hindi kailangan humingi ng pagsangayon para gumawa na aksyon sa pagpagsasawalang bisa. And Article 1396, ratification cleanses the contract from all its defect from the moment it was constituted. So sabi, simula sa oras daw na isinagawa ito, uh, ang pag-aaproba ay minililinis ang kontrata mula sa, mula sa lahat ng depekto. Article 1397 The action for annulment of contracts may be instituted by all who are thereby obliged principally or subsidiarily. However, persons who are capable cannot allege the incapacity of those with whom they contracted, nor can those who exerted intimidation, violence, or undue influence, or employed fraud or caused mistake based based their action upon this clause of the contract. In Article 1398, an obligation having been annulled, the contracting party shall restore to each other the things which have been the subject matter of the contract, with their fruits and the price with its interest, except cases provided by law. And in obligations to render service, The value thereof shall be the basis for damages. So, sinasabi dito, kapag ang mga obligasyon ay naipawalang bisa na, ang mga napagkasundoan daw na bagay ng isang partido ay maaari itong ibalik noong may bisa pa ang kontrata. Article 1399 
when the defect of the contract consists in the incapacity of one of the parties, the inca incapacitated person is not obliged to make any restitution except in so far as he has been benefited by the thing or price received by him. So sabi naman, ang may kapansanang tao daw ay hindi kinakailangan gumawa ng anumang restitution maliban sa napakinabangang bagay. In Article 14.00 Whenever the person obliged by the decree of annulment to return the thing cannot do so because it has been lost through his fault, he shall return the fruits received and the value of the things at the time of the loss with interest from the same date. So, sabi naman dito, ang isang tao daw ay obligadong magpasya dala ng kautusan ng pagkawalang bisa na ibalik ang isang bagay ay hindi ito magagawa dahil sa ito ay nawala dala ng kanyang pagkakamali. So, kailangan niya ibalik at ang, at ang halaga ng mga bagay kung kailan ito nawala. Article 14.01 the action of annulment of contracts shall be extinguished when the thing which is the object thereof is lost through the fraud or fault of the person who has right to institute the proceedings. If the right of action is based upon the incapacity of any one of the contracting parties, the loss of the thing shall not, shall not be an obstacle to the success of the action, unless said loss took place through the fraud or fault of the plaintiff. So, sabi dito, ang pagpasawalang bisa daw ng isang kontrata ay maaring mawala kung ang taong nagpapasawalang bisa ay may pagkakamali na nagresulta sa pagkawala o pagkasira ng isang bagay na tinutukoy sa kasunduan. And Article 14.02 As long as one of the contracting parties does not restore what in virtue of the decree of annulment he is bound to return. The other cannot be compelled to comply with what is incumbent, incumbent upon him. And sabi, hanggat isa, isa daw sa mga partido ay hindi pa binabalik ang kanyang responsibilidad na ibalik, ang kabilang partido ay hindi pwedeng pilitin na gawin ang nakatoka niyang gawain. Enforceable contracts. So, what makes a contract enforceable? Uh, Pasisimple na lang natin itong Article 14.03. Uh, we have three situations or reason kung bakit nagiging enforceable ang ating contract. So, number one, uh, no authority or unauthorized contracts. So, lahat ng mga contracts entered to that name or using the name of another person which is not authorized are, enforcer, are unenforceable contracts. So, number two, yung mga transactions that are mentioned under is statute of frauds kapag sila ay nag-enter uh, nag ka sa transaction na ito orally. So, pag sinabi natin orally, salita lang, walang written contract. And lastly, both parties are incapacitated. So, ang pagkakaiba nito ay sa voidable contract. Sa voidable contract kasi ay isa lang yung incap incapacitated, yung kabilang party, capacitated. However, kapag both parties na ang, ang incapacitated, uh, magiging unforceable na yung contract natin. Article 14.04 Unauthorized contracts are governed by Article 13.17 and the principles of agency. So, in the relation to Article 13.17, no one may, con may contract in the, s in the name of another without the consent of whose behalf the agent is representing. And Article 14.05, contracts infringing the statute of frauds referred to, to in number 2 of Article 14.03 
are ratified by the failure to object to the presentation of oral evidence to prove the same or by the acceptance of benefits under them. So, yung mga kontratang lumalabag daw sa batas na statute of frauds na tinutukoy sa number 2 ng Article 14.3.03 ay pinag- pinapatibay ng kabiguan ng pagtutot sa presentasyon upang patunayan ang pandaraya. 0.6 When a contract in unfor- is enforceable under the statute of frauds and a public document is necessary for its registration in the registry of deeds, the parties may avail themselves of the right under Article 1357. So, sabi dito, kung ang kasunduan daw ay kinakailangan ipatupad sa ilalim ng kautosang nauukol sa pandaraya, uh, kailangan samantalahin ng bawat partido ang karapatang ito. So, ang mga ito ay kinakailangan din upang maprotektahan ang kasunduan at ang mga obligasyon ng bawat panig sa ilalim ng Article 1357. Article 1407 In a contract where both parties are incapable of giving consent, express or implied ratification by the parent or guardian, as the case may be of one of the contracting parties, shall give the contract the same effect as if only one of them were incapacitated. If ratification is made by the parents or guardians, as the case may be of both contracting parties, the contract shall be validated from the inception. So, sabi naman dito, kung ang dalawang partido daw ay walang kakayahan na magbigay ng consent, ang isa sa mga partido ay nagbibigay sa kasunduan na na paparehong epekto ng kung sakaling isa lamang sa kanila ay walang kakayahan or incapacitated nga. And Article 14.08 Unenforceable contracts cannot be assailed by third person. So, ang mga kasunduan daw uh, hindi maaaring ipagtibay, hindi maaaring parusahan ng mga taong hindi nagpapabi- napapabilang sa kasunduan. Void or inexistent contracts. Article 14.09. The following contracts are inexistent and void from the beginning. So, ang mga sumusunod na kontrata daw ay walang bisa sa simulat sa pol pa lang. Number 1. Mga kontrata na ang dahilan, layunin, at intensyon ay labag sa batas, moral, mabuting pamantayan, pampob pampublikong utos o pampublikong patakaran. Pangalawa, mga kontrata na walang dudang kunwarian o gawagawa lamang. Pangatlo, mga kontrata na may dahilan at layunin na hindi umiiral sa panahon ng transaksyon. Pangapat, mga kontrata na ang layunin ay labas sa komersyo ng sangkatauhan. Panglima, mga kontrata na nagmumungkahi ng imposibleng gawain. Ang anim, mga kontrata na kung saan ang intensyon ng bawat partido tungkol sa pangunahing layunin nito ay hindi matiyak. At huli, uh, mga kontrata na hay- hayagang ipinagbabawal o dineklarang walang bisa ng batas. Article 14.10 The action or defense for the declaration of the inexistence of a contract does not prescribe. So, yung action daw para ideklara ang kawalan ng kontrata ay hindi iuuto so yahatol. And Article 14.11 When the nullity proceeds from the illegality of the cause or object of the contract and the act of constitutes a criminal offense, both parties being in pan- pari delicto. So, pari delicto yan na typo lang po. And pag sinabi nating pari delicto, it is in equal fault, a universal doctrine which holds that no action arises in equity or at law from an illegal contract. So they, they shall have no action against each other and both shall be prosecuted. Moreover, the provision of the penal code relative to the disposal of effects or instruments of crime shall be applicable 
to the things or the price of the contract. And this rule shall be applicable when only one of the parties is guilty, but the innocent one may claim what he has given and shall not be bound to comply with his promise. Article 14.12 If the act in which the unlawful of or forbidden cause consists does, does not constitute a criminal offense, the following rule shall be observed. So una, kapag gidaw yung pagkakamali sa partido ng kaparehong kampo na nakipagkasunduan alin man, ay maaaring bumawi ng kanilang ibinigay na nakapaloob sa kontrata o anumang kagustuhan nila na gawin ng kabilang partido. Pangalawa, kapag daw ang isa sa nakipagkasundong partido ay nagkasala, hindi nila maaaring bawiin ng anumang naibigay na nila sa kadahilan ng ito, ito ang nasa kontrata. Uh, subalit yung kabilang partido na hindi nagawa ng mali ang pwedeng humiling na ibalik ang mga naibigay niya nang wala nang dapat pang gampanang pangako. Article 1413 Interest paid in excess of the in interest allowed by the usury laws may be recovered by the debtor with interest thereon from the date of the payment. So sabi, ang interest daw na binayaran na kung saan humigit pa sa interest na pinaghahintulutan ng usury laws. So, pag sinabi natin usury laws, it is the illegal act of charging for a loan a higher rate of interest than that which is allowed by law. So, maaari daw maibalik sa nangutang kasama ang interest simula sa araw na kung saan binayaran niya ito. In Article 1414, When money is paid or property delivered for an illegal purpose, the contract may be repudiated by one of the parties before the purpose has been accomplished or before any damage has been caused to a third party, third person. In such case, the courts may, if the public interest will thus be subserved, allow the party repudiating the contract to recover the money or property. So, kapag daw yung pera ay binayaran o yung mga ari-arian ay inihat inihatid para sa isang legal na layunin, ang kasunduan ay maaaring itakwil ng isa sa mga partido bago ang naisakato parang mga layunin. So, sa gayong sitwasyon, ang korte daw ay maaaring pahintulutan ang partido na nagtatakwil ng kasunduan na bawiin ng pera o ari-arian kung ito ay magiging naangkop sa pampublikong interes. And Article 1415, where one of the parties to, to an illegal contract is incapable of giving, uh, is giving consent, the courts may, if the interest of justice so demand, allow recovery of money or property delivered by the incapacitated person. So, kung ang isang panig daw sa kasunduan ay walang kapasidad na magbigay ng pagpapayagan, ng pagpapayagan, ang mga hukom ay maaaring mamayagan sa pagbalik ng binayad o sa mga ari-ari ang naibigay nito sa ngalan ng hustisya. Article 14.16 When the agreement is not illegal per se, but is merely prohibited and the prohibition by the law is designed for the protection of the plaintiff. He may, if public policy is thereby enhanced, recover what he has paid or delivered. So, sabi, kung ang nagpapasang, nagpagsang ayunan daw ay hindi labag sa batas, pero ito ay pinagpabawal, at ang pagbabawal ay ayon sa batas, ay ginagawa para protection ang nagdemanda. So, kung pampubliko na Polisya ay maaaring magdagdag, maibalik sa kanya kung ano ang binayaran niya or dinala. Article 1417, sabi naman dito, When the price of any article or commodity is determined by statute or by authority of law, any person paying any amount in excess of the maximum price 
allowed me recover such excess. Sa kapag ang presyo ng anumang bilihin o produkto ay itinalaga ng batas o sa kapangyarihan ng batas, ang sino man daw na magbayad ng sobra ay maaaring bawiin ang kalabisan. And Article 1418, when the law fixes or author authorizes the fixing of the maximum number of hours of labor and a contract is ex is entered into whereby a laborer undertakes to work longer than the maximum thus fixed, he may demand additional compensation for service rendered beyond the time limit. So, sabi naman dito, kung aayusin daw ng batas o pinapahintulutan nito ang paglaan ng pinakamataas na bilang ng oras ng pagtatrabaho, ang kawani daw ay maaaring humingi ng karagdagang kabayaran sa labis na oras ng servisyong kanyang inilaan. And Article 1419 When the law sets or authorizes the setting of a minimum wages Wage for laborers and a contract is agreed upon by the by the by which a laborer accepts a lower wage, he shall be entitled to recover the deficiency. So kapag naman daw yung batas ay nagtalaga o pinahintulutan ng pagtatakda ng minimum wage para sa mga trabahador, at ang kontrata ay napagkasundoan na kung saan ang trabahador ay tumanggap ng maliit na sahod, ang trabahador daw ay may karapatan na maibalik sa kanya ang kulang. And Article 1420 In case of a divisible contract, if the illegal terms can be separated from the legal ones, the latter may be enforced. So, sa mga kaso na maaaring hatian, Hatiin daw ang kontrata kung ang illegal na mga bahagi nito ay maaaring ihiwalay sa mga legal na bahagi, ito daw ay ipinatutupad. And Article 1421, The defense of illegality of contracts is not available to the to third persons whose interests are not directly affected. And sabi daw, ang defense ng illegal na na, na Kasunduan ay hindi magigamit ng ibang tao na ang mga interest ay hindi direktang naapektuhan nito. And last, Article 1422. A contract which is the direct result of a previous illegal contract is also void and in existence. So, ang sabi naman, ang isang kasunduan daw na bunga lamang ng isang naunang kasunduan na illegal ay siya walang visa. Interpretation of Contracts Ang parte na ito ay nakabase sa Civil Code Article 1370 to 1379. Bakit nga ba kailangan natin pagkakalan itong Interpretation of Contracts? Dahil tayo, as future civil engineers and professionals, hindi mawawala sa trabaho natin ng kontrata. Bawat deal, kailangan may kontrata. Bawat project na makaklose, kailangan may kontrata. So, it is our responsibility para intindihin ang mga nakapaloob sa kontrata. And if not, ano ang mangyayari? Pwede maging consequence niyan, worst case scenario is matanggalan ng lisensya or makulong ka or mapagbayad ka ng danyos na malaki. Bago natin alamin ang mga article na nakapaloob sa interpretation of contracts, alamin muna natin ang meaning ng interpretation. Interpretation is the act of making intelligible that was not before understood, ambiguous, or not obvious. Yung interpretation na sinasabi dito is pag nag-form na ng contract, may instances na nagkakaroon ng misunderstanding dun sa written instrument, which is yung kontrata. Hindi nagkakatugma yung intention dun sa nakasulat sa kontrata minsan. Kaya mayroon tayong ganito. Kaya kailangan i-interpret at babasahin yung contract to check if nagre-reflect ba yung intention or purpose ng paggawa ng kontrata sa mismong nakasulat or nakapaloob sa kontrata. So, kapag hindi nagtutugma yung pag interpret ng contract, pwede natin pabago yung contract or contract reformation na tinatawag. 
Now, let's move on to Article 1370. Kung ang mga napagkasunduan sa kontrata ay malinaw at hindi nagiiwan ng pagdududa sa intensyon ng mga partido, ang literal na ibig sabihin ng mga napagkasunduan ang mananaig. Kung ang mga termino ay iba sa intensyon ng mga partido, ang intensyon ang mananaig. Kaya ito yung sinasabi ng Article 1370. Let's emphasize, the intention always prevails. As I have said earlier, na kaya natin ito ginagawa sa pag interpret ng wording sa contract, is to make sure na magkatugma ang intention at kontrata. Yun ang sinasabi ng Article 1370, which in where let's highlight para makita nyo yung point. If the words appear to be contrary to the evident intention of the parties, the latter shall prevail over the former. The latter over the former. Former meaning dati ang tinutukoy doon yung wordings sa kontrata na iba yung meaning while yung latter is yung intention talaga. Pero kadalasa naman, very literal lang yung nasa kontrata, straight to the point. Sabi nga, hindi naman siya ginagamitin ng figurative speech, katulad ng mga literary works. Pero may times talaga na nagiging komplikado yung kontrata, nagkakaroon na ng iba-ibang meanings, kaya kailangan nito. Article 1371 Upang hatula ng intensyon ng mga nagkasundo, ang kaalinsabay at kasunod na kilos ang siyang pangunahing ikonsidera. Emphasize lang natin ulit yung intensyon. Yung mga intensyon ng mga nagkasundo, yun yung pagbabasehan natin kung ano ang dapat na nakalagay sa kontrata. Ganun yun. Ano ba ginawa nila after ma-perfect yung contract? Yun ang basehan natin para malaman or mag-guide kung ano ba dapat ang laman ng kontrata. Article 1372 Gaano man kapangkalahatan ang mga tuntunin ng isang kontrata, hindi sila dapat intindihin upang unawain ang mga bagay na naiiba at mga kaso na iba mula sa mga pinagkasunduan ng mga partido. Ito tungkol sa mga pagjegeneralize na term. May example tayo dito para mas maintindihan. S sold to be his house including all furniture. In interpreting this written contract, ang maiintindihan natin lahat ng nasa bahay ni S ay mapupunta kay B. However, paano kung may nakapaloob sa bahay na binibenta na hindi naman kay S? Interpreting this contract, those items that is in S house that does not belong to S is excluded or hindi siya kasama sa mapapaari kay B. Since to begin with, hindi naman siya kay S. Paano pag sa kapitbahay yun, hiniram lang so may limitations. Yun ang nakasaad kay Article 1372. Although sinabi na general, which in words sa example na to, all was the term used to generalize. Hindi natin mapipiloso po na sasabihin na hindi lahat daw ng gamit sa contract sa akin mapupunta. No, this is not the case. Moving on to Article 1373. Kung ang kasunduan ay mayroong kahulugan maliban sa isa, ang kahulugan na magbibigay silbi dito ang masusunod. May mga pagkakataon na yung term na nakalagay sa written contract is magbibigay ng dalawa o higit pang meaning. Tignan natin itong example na ito. Sabit Singh son owns two lands, one he owns exclusively and one he co-owns with Irab Estrada. Without specifying, Sabit sells his parcel of land to Ateglo. Irab did not give his consent to the sale. Dahil hindi binigay ni Irab yung consent niya or pagpayag niya na ibenta yung lupa, ang magiging interpretation nito ay ang binenta na lupa ni Sabit ay yung pagmamayari lang niya at hindi yung lupa na pagmamayari ni Sabit Singson kasama si Irab. Example naman sa field is kunwari nakalagay sa contract para makapagpatayo ng building, kailangan is Isuzu vehicle. E walang nakalagay kung what specific vehicle yung planage ng contractor. E yung contractor, may SUV na Isuzu. 
and boom track na Isuzu. So, alin doon yung magde-define ng kung anong vehicle yung tinutukoy. Since pagtatayo ng isang building ang nasa kontrata, ang tinutukoy doon na Isuzu vehicle is yung boom track. Dahil aanin mo yung SUV sa pagtatayo ng building, di ba? Pero for example purposes lang naman to. Ang kailangan kasi sa kontrata sa mga projects, nakaspecify yung pledge mo na equipments para sa project na itatayo. Nakalagay doon kung ilan yung number of units, capacity ng equipment, model, make, plate number, serial number, at iba pa. Kaya pag chinek yan at hindi nakita yung plenage na equipment, magkakaroon ng problema. Pwede maging grounds of termination of contract. Kasi yung ibang contractor, ang ginagawa nila, tumatanggap din ng ibang projects. So, kaya ginagamit nilang equipments na nakapledge tayo sa ibang projects. Natakal natin yun sa fundamentals na bawal yun, na discuss ni sir yun. Kaya isa yun sa importante, yung tinatawag doon is pledge list of equipment for the project. Article 1374, ang iba't ibang kasunduan ng isang kontrata ay dapat bigyan kahulugan ng magkasama dahil sa mga hindi tiyak sa diwa na maaaring magresulta mula sa lahat ng mga ito na kinuha magkasama. Ang ini-imply lang dito sa Article 1374 is kailangan i-relate yung mga sentences na nakapaloob sa kontrata kasi may mga cases na hindi lang stand alone ang sentences sa kontrata. Nakadepende siya sa isa pang sentence na nakapaloob sa kontrata. Together or magkasama. Lahat. Hindi ka pwede mag-assume na ang nababasa mo pa lang is portion ng contract. Hindi pwede na mag-interpret na hindi mo nababasa lahat. Let's look at the example. X lists his house to Y. X forbid Y from subleasing the property without his consent. Further stipulated, if Y subleased the property to a third person, there will be an additional 1,000 pesos per month payment on top of his rent. Pag ang binasa niya lang is yung second sentence which states further stipulated, if Y subleased the property to a third person, there will be an additional 1,000 pesos per month payment on top of his rent. Ang magiging understanding natin dyan is pwede niya ilis yung property sa iba. Pero, pag binasa natin buo yung contract, yun pala ay multa na since pinagbabawalan ilis sa iba yung property. So, it's a form of penalty. Pwede din tong situation na to sa field. Kunwari, ang nakasaad sa contract, pinabawal ni client na magkaroon ng delay si contractor. Tapos, ang nabasa lang ni contractor is magbabayad ng ilang pesos pag na-delay. Pag di niya binasa buo yung kontrata, baka ang mag interpretation niya is pwedeng ma-delay yung project, which is mali. Kasi, ang nakalagay sa kontrata is bawal or finoporbid ni client na ma-delay si contractor. Based sa interview ko, kailangan talaga min nabasa yung contracts. Why? Kasi pag di mo binasa yan at nagkapirmahan kayo sa project and na-delay si contractor tapos hindi mo siya ma-penalty kasi per contract nyo wala naman nakalagay na pwede mo siya i-penalize. Sa contract din nakalagay yung fee tapos kailan babayaran. Sino magsasuffer? Marami kasi hindi magiging liable si contractor sa delay. Wala namang nakalagay sa contract so dapat talagang binabasa. Ang mga silitang may iba't ibang pakahulugan ay uunawain sa paraan na kung saan pinakamalapit sa pinagmulat at bagay ng kontrata. So, let's read the example. Romeo leads to Elena a roof for the purpose of erecting and advertising sign. The contract provides for the termination of the list by Elena if a building should be constructed on an adjoining property of such height to obscure the view of Elena's sign. There was erected on the roof of an adjoining building a sign which obstructed the view of Elena's sign. In this case, the term building is used in the contract may be interpreted as to include the obstructing sign, having in mind the nature and object of the contract. 
the building term doesn't really mean building talaga as in house or what. Ang purpose nung paggamit ng building is object na makakatakip ng sign. So, hindi dapat literal na i out na yung tumakip sa sign is sign lang din naman at hindi building. Kasi ang purpose mismo ng contract is bawal matakpan yung sign. So, pwede maging ground yun for termination of the lease. Let's move on to Article 1376. Ang dating kinasanayan o kinaugalian ng lugar ay maaaring gamitin sa pagbibigay kahulugan sa mga hindi malinaw sa kontrata. At papalitan nito ang mga naalis sa kasunduan na napagkasunduan. Ito, based on my research and interview, mayroon ako nalaman. So, pag ang mga contractor, di ba gumagawa na yan ng project? So, mayroon tayong tinatawag na Non-workable day. Ano ang non-workable day? Ito, for example, may bagyo or low pressure area ng isang linggo. So, madedelay, di ba? E mayroon silang schedule na dapat sundin. Ngayon, nasa kontrata naman na okay lang pag non-workable day. Pero alam nyo kung ano nagiging mali nila. Hindi nila nare-report sa office or nare-request ng time suspension kasi nasa customs yun ng office. Kailangan yun para ma-declare na non-workable day. So, pag di report ng contractor or na-request yung non-workable day na yun, magkakaroon sila ng negative S-curb. Ano yung negative S-curb? Yun yung slippage or delayed sila sa mga schedule time nila. Malaki ang nagiging epekto nun sa next project nila kasi pag masyado malaki ang percentage ng slippage ng isang constructor, di sila pinapayagan magbid. Meron din naman tayong tinatawag na positive S-curve or positive slippage. Ibig sabihin, beyond sila or mas maaga nila na-accomplish yung nakaschedule sa project. Though hindi maka-count as positive S-curve, kung maaga nga natapos pero madami namang mali. So, ang ending nun, remove and replace. O de negative pa din kahit na maaga natapos. Article 1377, ang interpretasyon ng mga malalabong salita o nakasaad sa kontrata ay hindi papaboran ang partido na responsable sa kalabuan nito. Sa interpretasyon ng kontrata, pag may malabo at ini-interpret, hindi dapat pabor sa dahilan or nag-cost ng hindi kalinawan. For example, si Party A ang nag-draft ng kontrata at may malabo. Pag ini-interpret na yung kontrata, hindi dapat pabor kay Party A yung pag-interpret kasi siya yung nag-cost ng obscurity. Now, let's move on to Article 1378. Kung talagang imposibleng pagkasunduan ang pagdududa gamit ang mga probisyon sa nakaraang artikulo at ang pagdududa ay napapatungkol sa mga incidental na pangyayari, sa gratuitos na kontrata, ang may pinakakaunti ang paglilipat ng karapatan at interes ang masusunod. Kung ang kontrata ay onerous, ang pagdududa ay isa sa ayos na ang pabor ay sa dalawang may interes. Ano nga ba ang gratuitus at onerous? Ang gratuitus, cause is liberality of the one donating the object. While yung onerous may exchange of valuable considerations. Tingnan natin yung example for gratuitous contract. It was not clear whether A lent or donated to B a specific phone. Is the contract a comodatum or donation? Comodatum meaning pinapahiram. Sabi sa Article 1378, pag daw gratuitous contract, mas kinoconsider yung pinakakaunti yung transmission of rights. Sa dalawa, kung donated or bigay, ano mas onti na na-transmit na rights? Yung pahiram lang or lent, di ba? Therefore, komodatum siya or pinapahiram lang siya, di siya bigay. Now, let's move on for the example of an onerous contract. It was not clear whether A sold or leased B to a building. Is the contract a sale or lease? This time, it is an onerous contract since ang pinag-uusapan is sale or lease. So, balikan natin ang sinasabi sa Article 1378. Pag onerous, greatest reciprocity, mas malaki yung transfer of rights. Meaning, sale yung sagot sa second example. Sa second paragraph naman tayo ng Article 1378. 
kung may pagdududa sa mga prinsipal na dahilan ng kontrata sa pamamaraan na hindi na maaaring malaman kung ano ang intensyon at lakas ng loob ng mga partido, ang kontrata ay magiging labag sa batas. Ibig sabihin, pag talagang hindi ma-resolve yung contract, yung contract maituturing na natin siyang null and void or walang bias. For example, may binili na lupa, nagkabayaran na, pero hindi makita kung saan yung binili na lupa. Di matukoy kung saan yung location. So, dahil sa grounds na yun, mabavoid yung contract. Simple as that. Now, let's move on to the last article, which is Article 1379. Ang mga prinsipyo ng interpretasyon na nakasaad sa Rule 123 ng Rules of Court ay dapat ding sundin sa paggawa ng mga kasunduan. Ininterpret yung mga kontrata, ang susundin ay ang Rule 123 ng Rule of Court. Di lang sa pag-interpret, pero guide din siya sa paggawa ng kontrata. Dagdag ka alaman, alam mo ba na mas maraming proseso ang paggawa ng kontrata kapag public or government ang nagpapagawa ng isang building? Nakabase ito sa RA 9184 or the Government Procurement Act. Pag private, mas simple ang specifications ay nakabase sa Philippine Standards na NSCP or National Structural Code of the Philippines. Yung NSCP na yan, nakabase din dyan syempre yung mga projects ng government din. Usually naman, may legal team or legal advisor pagdating sa permahan ng contract. No, kahit given na may legal advisors or consultants, kailangan pa din natin alamin or intindihin ang mga nilalaman ng kontrata. Kasi pag nasa mismong trabaho na tayo, madalas talaga nagkakaproblema sa kontrata. Dahil may instances na hindi malinaw yung general terms, cost or price, scope of work, or schedule. Pag hindi nagtutugma sa specifications ng project na nakapaloob sa kontrata, yung ginagawa ng contractor, iibahin yan, remove and replace. Meaning, mas madedale yung schedule ng completion ng project at mas mataas ang cost. That's why kailangan sundin at intindihin yung kontrata. Isa pang dahilan kung bakit dapat intindihin ang kontrata is bago ka pumirma, alam mo kung ano'y pinapasukan mo. Because pag nagkaroon ng problema sa project at nag kadaman dahan may panlaban ka lamang ang may alam